This is lecture one of three on Samuel Scheffler's Death and the Afterlife, a book that's based on meditations on how he thinks humans would react to the doomsday scenario. For our purposes, let's think of the doomsday scenario as the scenario that human life is going to end, but the earth gets to persist. And this is going to happen shortly after your own natural death. That's important. You're not affected by the doomsday scenario in the sense that you will be killed by it. Instead, you know with absolute certainty that it's going to happen. And there are lots of variants on this. We can talk about the scenario where you know it's going to happen, but nobody else does, or a scenario in which everybody already knows that this is going to happen, just like in the children of men scenario. We can play around with dates. Is it going to happen 30 days after you die? A year? Two years? Or it'll be like the children of men scenario, where people are going to die their natural deaths over the course of generations. The very first fact, and I do think it is a fact, that Scheffler points out is that most people, if they were to discover that doomsday was going to happen, will care very much. They'll be very upset and they're probably going to change their lives quite a bit in reaction to it. I know I would. And this already shows a certain kind of insight. It shows that we care about the end of humanity, even if it antedates our own natural deaths. Scheffler thinks that this shows that some of our values, at least some of them, are three things. Non-experiential, non-consequentialist, and conservative. Scheffler thinks that valuing something for a person is different from them believing that something is valuable. And he thinks that this is an important distinction. There are a lot of things that we might believe are valuable. When asked about it, we might say that these are valuable things, but we don't ourselves seem to value them. I'm trying to come up with some examples, and this is, these examples are not going to be perfect because some of you do value these things. So one example might be, for young people, classical music. I know some young people who really do value it quite a bit. They listen to it. They perform it. But for a great deal of young people, they believe that it's valuable. They recognize that it's around in the culture. People give money to it, and they think that's a fine thing. It's something good to have around. But they don't themselves value it in the sense of doing anything that preserves it or do anything that shows that it plays a role in their lives. Other examples I might give are endangered human languages. I think if you were to ask many people, is it a tragedy that certain human languages are dying out because people no longer speak them, I think a lot of people will say, yes, that's a real shame. I certainly do. But at the same time, most people don't do anything to try to do anything about it. They don't try to learn endangered languages. They don't study them in college. They don't even give money to organizations that try to preserve it. So in one sense, I think people believe that these things are valuable, but they don't value it themselves. A final example that I think seems to be true of some people is the notion of ideological diversity. There are many people and communities and institutions that claim to value a diverse range of opinions. They say that that's a valuable thing to have around, to have a debate. But at the same time, when those debates happen, people react by saying that certain positions are stupid, immoral, and only idiots believe them. So in many ways, ideological diversity is something people seem to believe is valuable. But when it comes to their own lives, they would rather not be around people who have significantly different ideological opinions from them. The certain patterning of communities on the internet and also in American life show this to be true. The lesson from these examples, if they're any good, is that valuing is more than just believing something to be valuable. It's a whole set of things. It's a set of feelings, 
dispositions and actions. And dispositions are things like how you would react in certain circumstances. Believing that classical music is valuable is different from valuing it in the sense that if I were to start playing some, someone who values it would really cherish the experience. And someone who only believes it to be valuable might just walk away. Valuing is more than just belief, it's doing and feeling. So when Scheffler says that the doomsday scenario shows that we value things in certain ways, Scheffler thinks that your reaction or our reaction to the doomsday scenario shows that some of our values are non-experiential. You value some things that are not about your own subjective experiences. Valuing that humanity continues after your own death shows that you have at least one value that doesn't depend on you experiencing the thing yourself. It's non-consequentialist. Your value of humanity doesn't seem to derive on cost-benefit analyses of the net good or net bad of humanity. What does this mean? It means that you're not basing your reaction to the doomsday scenario on examining the world and seeing what's good and what's bad about the scenario. It's actually a very interesting exercise, and I'm going to leave it as a possible project for you, either as a podcast or a dialogue with a friend or your own writing. And the exercise is this. Actually try doing a cost-benefit analysis of removing humans from the earth entirely. Is this a net good or a net bad? I don't think the answer is all that obvious. But regardless of the answer, Scheffler would say that's a rather perverse way of reacting to the doomsday scenario. In reality, he thinks most people will react to think that it's horrible, one of the worst things that can happen. And that reaction isn't based on examining the costs and benefits of removing humans from the earth. And finally, our values are shown to be conservative in the doomsday scenario. Insofar as you react to the doomsday scenario with horror or dread, you're showing that your values are conservative. Valuing, it's almost definitional of valuing. That if you value something, you'd like it to stick around. Some people really do value endangered human languages. They begin their career as linguists, travel to those communities, learn as much as they can, record people, transcribe it down. Valuing endangered human languages is a matter of doing things that preserve and sustain an endangered human language to make sure that it persists into the future in some form or another. The doomsday scenario shows that your values are conservative because your value of humanity continuing after your own death is purely a matter of trying to preserve and sustain something. Scheffler also draws negative conclusions from the doomsday scenario. Certain theses about human beings are wrong. Most notably, the conjunction of instrumental rationality and egoism. Instrumental rationality is the kind of thinking that maximizes your own subjective goals without regard to the desirability or goodness of those goals. So, for instance, you might have a subjective goal of eating a burger. Instrumental rationality is the thinking that goes into what's the best way for me to accomplish that goal. Similarly, you might have the goal of exterminating a certain set of people. Instrumental rationality is a way of thinking about what's the best way of going about accomplishing that goal. Instrumental rationality doesn't have any regard for whether the goals are good or bad. Egoism is the pursuit of your own subjective pleasures. People who only pursue their own pleasure are egoists. What the doomsday scenario shows for Scheffler is that most people 
are not instrumentally rational in pursuit of egoistic goals. They're not pursuing things to maximize their own subjective pleasures. The fact that people value the persistence of humanity after their own death shows that they're valuing something over and above their personal values, their own pleasures. And so people are not pursuing purely the kind of things that maximize their own pleasures. What's interesting about the doomsday scenario is that it seems to be a generalization of another value we seem to have in our lives. And that value is the value of wanting to die before all of your loved ones do. I don't mean all of your loved ones. I don't think a lot of you want to die before your parents say. I mean, we seem to want our own lifespans not to extend longer than the natural lifespans of our loved ones. We don't want to be the last person that we know to die. Your parents certainly do not want to outlive you. As your older professor, I certainly don't want to outlive your natural lifespan. This kind of value or desire already shows that some of our values are non-consequentialist, non-egoistic, and non-experiential. An examination of why we have such a desire is instructive. We all know we're going to die eventually. The question is how we're envisioning the world after our own deaths. Do we have a relationship with that future? If our loved ones are in that future, we have a personalized relationship with it. Insofar as the people in it love us and remember us and think about us, and to a large extent, our loved ones and other people around us are going to help perpetuate our values into the future. The question of personalizing your relationship to the future is the question of how do you preserve your values in a world where you're not in it? Scheffler thinks that when we look at cultures, especially old cultures, we're going to find that the traditions and rituals that have been built around them are precisely the things that show how important it is for human beings to preserve their values so that they feel at home in the world in the future, even though they're dead. The Chinese, Jewish, many African tribal cultures, as well as the traditions and rituals of many ethnic groups, are there to mark the important values of their history, the importance that many humans place on traditions and rituals, show that they attach an incredible amount of importance to the survival of values of groups. The fact that many human beings will sacrifice their own lives in preservation of these traditions and values show how much more important they are than individual self-interests. Establishing your own relationship to your own future is just like this. It's why so many death rituals include doing the thing that the deceased person loved, going on a particular hike, scattering their ashes in a particular place in the world. Scheffler thinks that a lot of these tradition-based rituals are endangered in the doomsday scenario. How many people will do it knowing that there is no way for those values of that culture to persist into the future. I want to leave with a couple of discussion questions that I've always had about Scheffler when I read this chapter. Take 10 minutes to answer one of them and then come back to the second part of the lecture. And the question is this. When we try to personalize our relationship to the future, by ensuring that some of our values persist in it, whether through cultural traditions and rituals, or whether through leaving a will that tells people what to do with our stuff, or asking people to carry out our wishes. How much of it is actually non-egoistic or non-egocentric, as Scheffler thinks? Is there a way of understanding these practices where it's actually egoistic rather than non-egoistic. Think about this question and bring your answers with you to class.
Let's now talk about what kind of activities would be significantly different in a world in which the doomsday scenario were to happen. I've divided the kind of activities that I think all of us are involved in into three categories. Short time frame activities, things like the pursuit of bodily pleasures, like food, drink, and others. Social pleasures, like just hanging out with your friends and family, doing fun things with them that last a short period. And intellectual pleasures, and I count this not just reading and discussion, but film, maybe even music, the enjoyment of things on a cognitive level. Then we have sort of medium-term projects and activities, like caring for your own health, eating well, brushing your teeth, grooming, things like that. The pursuit of long-term relationships, such as friendships, love, having children would be another pursuit of long-term relationships, and also things associated with having a career, like going to a school, choosing a major, going to graduate school, applying for jobs, promotions, leaving jobs for better pursuits, things like that. And finally, I have very long time frame projects, things that people do, which a lot of people don't think they'll achieve in their lifetime, but hopefully they're establishing a movement so that it'll change things in the future. Things like curing cancer, reforming the electoral college, desegregating schools, inventions, things like that. If you think about it, one other way to divide up all of these activities is people-directed and not people-directed activities. I think that's actually important. When I look around, I think, I think of this as a very prominent division in the kind of activities that people pursue. People-directed activities are things that involve people and groups of people and communities. Non-people-directed, I'll include things like the preservation of non-human animals, the preservation of ecological conditions, diving in the deep sea to learn about sharks, trying to land on Mars, things like that. And a very important question in Scheffler's book is how many and which of these activities will be affected by the doomsday scenario and various different kinds of doomsday scenarios. For instance, if you knew that the world would end, humanity would end, 30 days after your death, which of these many activities would you immediately change or change in the medium or long term? What about in the children of men scenario? Scheffler thinks that a really good case can be made, that the long time frame projects are the first ones to go in any doomsday scenario. Why would people want to pursue the cure for cancer if humanity is going to die anyways? Why would it matter to people if American electoral reform were to happen, if people were going to all die very shortly after your own natural death? How much would we care about the environment if we knew that people were just going to disappear? Scheffler thinks many medium time frame activities are going to go by the wayside too. Would people really continue to have children if they knew humanity were to disappear 30 days after their own death? You might still have a career. Would you have the same career? How much would you care for your own health? And finally, whenever I teach Scheffler, one common theme that students come to me with is that they believe that the short time frame activities are the ones least threatened by the doomsday scenario. But when I read Scheffler, I detect that he's actually skeptical about that. He thinks that P.D. James, Alfonso Cuaron, and himself think that human beings would be so overtaken by a form of grief that maybe even the ordinary bodily pleasures and social pleasures or intellectual pleasures would go by the wayside as well. I don't think that's true myself. If anything, I think a great number of people will just become complete egoists, burn through as much of their life as possible, and go out in a blaze of glory. 
But I also think that there is a certain subgroup of other people that would react in the way that Scheffler, P.D. James, and Alfonso Cuaron depict. This is something we're going to talk about in class quite a bit. But whatever we answer, the argument goes that the more we think that human activities will be threatened by the doomsday scenario, the more it shows that human values are not egoistic. There's a very interesting and I think correct quotation from Scheffler's book, which is that the fact that all of us are going to die, which is true, we are all going to die, isn't the source of an emergency. World governments don't try to unite in order to try to solve the problem of all the people who are alive today will one day die. But if we were to learn that humanity will one day be extinct, we would consider that an emergency. There's a hypothesis that Scheffler thinks is well confirmed from the thought experiment that he's been examining in this first chapter. We value the lives of the loved ones who will outlive us more than we value our own lives. Easy choice to make, would you rather? Would you rather you die first and all of your loved ones live on? Or would you rather you get to live on and all of your loved ones will die now? I know what I would choose. But generalizing from that, we seem to value the lives of future people, even people we don't know and don't exist yet, more than we value the lives of ourselves and the currently living. Same would you rather. You get to die, but humanity gets a future. Or humanity has no future, but you get to live on. Scheffler believes that this shows that much of human values is targeted not at the self, but at the afterlife, where the afterlife is the world that exists after our own deaths. There's so many discussion questions for us. We're going to talk about what you think of this in class. I want you to think a little bit more deeply about some of the questions here at the end of this slide and just answer one of them in your writing responses for 10 minutes and bring it to class. First, do you think a case could be made that even subjectively pleasurable experiences we regularly now engage in would be less valued and less valuable in a doomsday scenario? Second question. Scheffler in the chapter is much more concerned with predicting how most people would react in the doomsday scenario, and he tries to draw some lessons from that. But instead of predicting how people would react, maybe you should think about how people should react. What kind of life decisions in the doomsday scenario would you consider acceptable, admirable, and reasonable? And what life decisions would you consider inadvisable or unreasonable or unobjectionable? Imagine you're the host of a radio show or a podcast where people call in with advice and everybody's just learned that the doomsday scenario is coming and they're asking you for advice of what to do with their life. So you have to tell them what you think they should do. What would that be? And finally, there's this question that Scheffler leaves in a footnote at the end of the chapter, which I think is worth thinking about also. Isn't human beings that you think we care about or just human-like practices and the history of human beings? Do you think our values would be threatened as much if we knew that some kind of technology or alien life form would sustain some of what humans achieved? Would it be less bad? Or is it important that it's the human species that survives? Lots of hypotheticals in this unit. Hope you enjoy it. See you in class.